with a voice of triumph. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3 and verse 11, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. To baptize doesn't mean to sprinkle, doesn't mean to pour, it means to plunge. It means to dip, it means to submerge, it means to immerse. He said this experience is going to be so traumatic and so dynamic that the only word I can use to describe it is a baptism. The Holy Ghost, you'll be plunged in it. You'll be immersed in it. You'll be filled with it. You will be baptized with the Spirit. And if being baptized isn't enough, he said,
Pentecost Sunday. God bless you. You may be seated, please. It's always a wonderful experience when God shows up and shows out. Yesterday afternoon, our ladies had quite an afternoon of fellowship and teaching and worship and food. And, you know, I had told Sister Blizzard when they started everything, I said, I tell you what I'll do. So the ladies don't have to do anything. I'll just order a bunch of pizzas. And uh, she said, okay. And so I told, uh, I told Sister Bain, Rod, I said, now, don't worry. I'm going to get pizzas. I happened to be by here yesterday. They had more food. They had food strung everywhere. And I'm thinking, well, so much for my pizza. Nobody wanted pizza, but that was real food. But they had a wonderful time, and I'm so glad that they were able to have their time. We had about 30 men and boys that showed up yesterday morning for our men's prayer meeting, and what a wonderful time we had there. We're glad to have our guest with us, Isaac Flores. We're glad you're with us today, Isaac. God bless you. Sister Petries, but I'm glad you're here because your husband's been looking real sad waiting for you to get here, but he is glad you made it here. And her friend Peggy that's with her from the next day. God bless you. Thank you for being here. My friend Esther is here. Esther Kim, God bless you, Esther. We're glad you're here today. I apologize for the heat. I didn't create it. I talked to someone today and I told them that one of the air conditioners was out. They said, well, if you turn the other one out, you can preach on the help you have an altar pull. Because nobody's going to want to go if it's 105. Um, I won't take advantage of that today, but the air conditioner on this side is out. They have put a, a fan in the back trying to draw some air from there. It will be by the help of the Lord fixed in the next day or two. They found out what is wrong with it. This one's doing all I can do to keep up with 105 degrees. But you know what? We came to have church. We've had church without air conditioning before. I was privileged to minister in several churches in the Philippines, and only one of them had air conditioning. And my wife said to me, can we have all the services here? I said, no, baby, we have to go and really see what it's like other places. If you've never been to Georgia camp meeting, where I grew up in camp meeting, it would be so hot and humid there, and we did it in an open-air tabernacle with mosquitoes and uh, humidity and heat and red mud. So I am thankful for a little bit of heat we have here today, just knowing that we have air conditioning that's working. If you get too warm on this side, you can't fill in the chairs on this side, and it may be a little cooler, and then some of you gonna think it's hotter. But uh, our Junior Usher Corps is coming right now to give you an opportunity to give it an offering. I want to remind you that pre please pray for our quiz teams as this week they go to district quiz finals this Friday and Saturday in San Bernardino, California. And uh, we are praying that God will bless them. Also, camp meeting begins a week from Wednesday in Costa Mesa at the Orange County Fairgrounds with Aaron Bounds, Brother Harold Hoffman, and Brother Jimmy Tony will all be ministering there along with our district superintendent, Brother Hodges. On the 24th of June, we have a youth service in the chapel, and then youth camp begins on June the 28th. So all of these things are coming up, and I want you to remember those things, and in just a few minutes, when we're through receiving the offering, the... Um, the junior sign, not the junior sign team, the amp sign team is coming to present. If you noticed all these young people dressed in black, they're not going to a funeral. This is all part of what they do with the amp sign team just before we come with the word of the Lord. Thank you for your giving on our building fund. God is doing tremendous things. He's pouring out blessings on those that are sacrificially giving. God is blessing in a very special way. And, uh, so continue your, your giving. We are uh, in the process of paying off the loan. We had to get some paperwork and some release fees made up before we can actually get it paid off. So it's going to be in the next couple of days the, that deed will be retired. And uh, we're going to believe God to help us pay off the, the zero interest rate notes. Uh, if you want to give electronically, our church secretary is standing right back here with the card reader. If you want to give online, it's ptlv.org. 
and the junior sign team, you know, or the amp sign team will come right after this. Jesus, thank you for giving to your children. God, for everyone that's made a sacrificial offering in this building fund, and God, for those that are faithful to you and they're tithing and in covenant with you, would you just open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings? God, those that have made a pledge and those that have given sacrificially and yet they're being tested and tried right now. God, would you just hold their hand and walk them through the trial to let them know it's not over yet, the blessings on the way. Meet every need in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give to
said, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he said, and you're going to be witnesses. You're going to be witnesses unto me. Amen. God bless you as they prepare for the insight team. Who is the church? You are the church. Jesus told the church to go. Jesus told you to go. Has the church ignored him? Have you? ignoring the command to go and tell them? We are each part of the problem. But we can be a part of the solution. The most glorious reason you exist is for the proclamation of the glory of God to the ends of the earth. Do you believe that? Does your church believe that? Are you living for you or Him? means to change direction in the midst of what's going on. Change. The Great Commission is our responsibility. It's not a choice. Do you need to change? Does your church need to change?
just give him praise right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On this Pentecost Sunday, what God has come to do and change lives. Is there more to it? Can I break this up? Okay. They want to stay up here and help me preach. That's all right. Y'all stay with me. Amen. Why don't you stand on your feet right now? Has God been good to you? Turn in your Bibles with me to the second chapter of Acts. You could never figure out I was going to Acts chapter 2, could you? Beginning with verse number 1. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. Said it when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Somebody say, fully come. When he finally got here. When he finally arrived. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord. That's not a Honda accord. They were together. They had their act together. They had their thoughts together. They had their ideas together. They had their hearts together. Let me tell you something. There's something that comes really strong when you come together. You hear me? The Bible said that, that Peter and John was headed up to the temple in Acts chapter 3. And they were together. They were going to pray together. They were going to praise together. There's something powerful that happens when the church gets together in Jesus' name. Right? And it said they were with all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Jesus, thank you for Pentecost. Thank you for these wonderful people that have come today. And God, speak to our hearts and minister to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Look at your neighbor, shake their hand, say, I'm glad you're here, but Pentecost, what's that? God bless you. You may be seated, please. All across America today, there are churches that, uh, and all around the world that are celebrating Pentecost Sunday. Quite often, after a Sunday night or a Tuesday night service, we'll, we'll go into a restaurant somebody and say, Where y'all? Were, were y'all from a church somewhere? You say, Yeah, what church is that? Well, it's Praise Tabernacle. What kind of church is that? Well, it's Pentecostal. They go, What's that? I wonder if the Catholics ever have to answer that. What 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 religion do you? I'm Catholic. What's that? You know, I guess unless you were in southern Louisiana where Pentecostals outnumber Catholics. Uh, some of you have never been to southern Louisiana, but I promise you there's more Pentecostal churches than any other kind of church down that way. But, um, you know, people will ask that question. What is, what is that? You know, even though there are millions of Pentecostals in America and many more millions all around the world, it's important that even on the day of Pentecost, we need to understand it was the birthday of the church. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. How many of you like a birthday celebration? Come on, you like one? Charity just had one. Where's Charity? There she is. She just had a birthday celebration. You know? And, uh, I was just rejoicing with she and her mom yesterday talking about how wonderful it is to have them be part of Praise Tabernacle and have a, a family, a church family and a home and in a place where we can be together. You know, there's something about having brothers and sisters and friends where you can just have people together and you feel like you're, you're doing something. Well, that's what the family of God is all about. When we get together, we have a good time. When we get together, we have a good time. You ladies yesterday, it was hot in here and it was miserable in here. But it didn't keep you from having a good time with one another and with the Lord yesterday. 
It made you appreciate your air conditioning a lot more. When Sister Blizzard got home, well, I won't tell you the rest of that story, but um, we were going to get a bite to eat. She said, forget it. I don't want to get out in that heat one more second. I'm tired of the heat. And I said, guess what? We get to go back and do it again tomorrow. But you know what? I haven't noticed anybody leaving today because it was hot. Yeah, it's miserable. It's not comfortable like we normally are. Normally, we got enough air conditioning. You can hang meat in here. We call it a meat locker sometimes. We got some air conditioning. We get it going. But today, it's not that way. But you know what? You came to the house of God. Uh, there's something about Pentecost. Uh, and Pentecost, when you understand what it's all about, uh, it's not a religion. It's not a denomination. Uh, but you need to understand the principle and the power and the purpose and the precepts of what Pentecost is all about. You see, I was going to just bring something to have you run the aisles and tell you to go home today. But God said, you know what? There are a lot of people coming to Praise Tabernacle that still don't understand what Pentecost is all about. We have new people every single Sunday here. Today I've read you the names of several new people. It's good to have my brother here. I'm glad you're here, my friend. God bless you. But, you know, I'm glad every time we have new people. And some of the new people that come here have heard of Pentecost, but they don't know what it is. They, they've heard people say, uh, Pentecost? I, look, when I grew up, Pentecost was not uh, cool. There was no, thing, no such thing as a charismatic church in those days. If you were Pentecostal, you got laughed at. Matter of fact, I would ask people where they went to church, and when they said Pentecost, they do it like this. Huh? Like they're scratching their nose. You see, that didn't go real good with me. When I got the Holy Ghost, I wanted to tell everybody I had the Holy Ghost. I didn't know Acts 1 and 8 was even in that book. I promise you. I didn't know one thing that was in the Bible. Other than Jesus, for God so loved the world, that gave His only begotten Son who don't believe in Him. I, I, that's the only thing I knew that was in the Bible. And I knew Jesus wept because it was the shortest verse in the Bible. And I could quote that one and win a candy bar sometime and went to a Sunday school class. They said, anybody can quote a scripture, we'll give you a candy bar. I jump up, Jesus went, where's the candy bar? <laughs> That's the reason I went, because they were giving away candy bars. We were so poor, we couldn't afford a candy bar. But when I went to church, it wasn't about that. I, I, I never knew anything about Pentecost. So getting raised up in it was not my deal. But when I got into it, and I got excited about it, because I knew that Jesus did something for me, that nothing else did. You see, when you understand, people thought we were crazy. How many of you remember the first time you walked into a Pentecostal church? That you were not Pentecostal and you walked into one? Tanya, I remember when you walked in. God, you let you. Sit right back over here. For a little while. And was ready to run. Not around the altar, out the door. Matter of fact, I asked Brother Adam after that first service. I said, did we scare her off? He said, I think so. Because we was having Pentecost the Sunday she came. We have Pentecost around here. It's not just one day a year. Every time we have church, we have Pentecost. We want another move of the Holy Ghost every time we come to the house of God. But you know what? He didn't scare her off. He didn't answer her questions. Matter of fact, I remember the first time I went to a Pentecostal church. You've heard me tell it before. I went home. My mother looked at me and grinned and she said, How was church, honey? I looked at my mama and I said, Those people are crazy. Like, not so, mama. She said, Why? I said, Mom, you will never believe this. When they started singing, everybody was singing. See, I'd gone to a church that had this choir. They did the singing. You chewed the gum, they didn't sing it. And so when I told my mama everybody sang, she said, well, what's wrong with that? I said, mama, everybody. The, the, the old lady behind me that couldn't sing, she was singing as loud as she could. And mama, you ain't going to believe this, they were all clapping their hands. She said, so what's wrong with that? I said, well, mama, that's what I do. They acted like they were at the ball game. 
Jack Sandler leaned over to him while going. He said, we need some popcorn, hot dogs, and, and coats in here. He said, it's like a free ring service. We're having church. I get on, come on, I'm excited when I go to the house of God. I remember telling my mother they acted like I did when I went to a ball game. When I went to a ball game, I got excited. I yelled, I screamed, I stomped, I jumped. I never was much of a spectator. I wanted to get out there and play ball. I've never been a spectator in church either. You hear me? God didn't call me to be a spectator, not when I could be a participant. Oh, some of you got spectatoritis all over you. All you can do is sit there and look at everybody else and sit on your hands and act like you cool. Well, last time I looked up cool, it just meant it's so hot. So why don't you just make up your mind that you're not ashamed of it? I remember when I went to college, I was 17 years old, and I had, uh, I had gone to, to Minnesota, and I found out those Yankees didn't have a sense of humor for us old Southern boys. And, and I got up there, and I remember I bought my first car in December of 1971. I, I finally got my first car, and I paid cash for it. And everybody loved to go down, if you've ever been to St. Paul, Minnesota, they loved to go downtown, or they did in those days, and in the downtown area, the police, they had one-way streets that were like four lanes wide going through the downtown area. It was a big loop. And everybody loved to go and ride the loop. And they would literally, unless you did something crazy, they let you drag race from red light to red light. And they had those red lights timed so you wasn't going to make the next block. You just would go one block. And I wasn't racing anyway because I paid too much money for my car. I paid $400 for it. Cash. But it was a nice car. It's a 66 Cutlass Oldsmobile, metallic blue, 13 coats of lacquer on it, everything under the hood was chrome. I just got a steal of a deal. If I had it today, it'd be worth $20,000 or more. I wish I had it today. But I loved it more than I love God. I'll tell you that story another time. But uh, I was driving around this crazy loop just from red light to red light, you know, waving at everybody. I had a beautiful car. Everybody loved to see the car. It was gorgeous. Oh, I can tell you, that car was drop-dead gorgeous. It was gorgeous. And uh, I noticed up ahead of me that there was this guy with his big, long beard, and he was jumping up and down on the street corner. And every time the light would change, he'd run out to the first car, and he would stick his hand in the window, he'd say something to him, and he'd jump up and down, he'd go to the next car, and I was the fourth car back, and on the third car, they started blowing the horns, we had to go. I went around that block again, I came back, and I was the fourth car back again. They were blowing the horns on there. I was trying to figure out what this guy was selling. He had to be selling something. I wanted to see if it was dope, I was going to tell him about Jesus. So I made up my mind, when the light changed, I acted like I was going and I stopped and I waited for the light to change again. So now I had the red light. He ran up right to my window with his big ugly face, stuck his head right in my window and said, Praise the Lord, I'm a Jesus freak! And he was going. I said, you a freak, all right. Oh, Jesus came into that. My righteous indignation got up inside of me. You don't look like Jesus. You don't look like Abraham. <laughs> Light changed. They blew the horns. I took off again and went back to the dormitory room. And I stayed there until about 1.30 in the morning. And I had a roommate that was about as spiritual as cornflakes. And, um, but he was a good guy. And I woke Steve up. And I said, Steve... He said, what? I said, get crazy. He said, what for? I said, we're fixing to go kidnap a Jesus freak. He said, you're going to do what? I said, we're fixing to go kidnap a Jesus freak. He said, have you lost your mind? I said, no, I've been laying here for two hours. I can't go to sleep. That guy is looking for something. He's found something, but he's looking for something more. Get dressed. He said, man, you're crazy. I said, get dressed. I always go off with your wild capers. You're going off with mine. Let's go. So we drive back down Minneapolis. We go around the loop twice. I don't see him. And I'm getting ready to go back. And finally, I see him sitting on the corner down there. And so I drive down to where he is. 
pull up in front of him. And I said, praise the Lord! He jumped up. He was about to go to sleep. He jumped up and down. Hallelujah! He ran out to the car. Praise the Lord! I'm a Jesus freak! I had my windows all down. I said, hop in! We don't go talk about Jesus! He dove through the back window. <laughs> we drove out in the middle of Dayton's parking lot. Dayton parking store. We drove out in the middle of the parking lot. Begin to tell him about who Jesus really was. He began to tell us about their experience. A group of them had been getting together for about six months and reading the Bible. They'd been doing dope and they were, were doing all kinds of things. They, they, they began to feel condemned over and they were, they were praying and they were reading the book of Acts and they saw it in the book of Acts and something came alive in the book of Acts with them. They began to read in Acts chapter 2 about the Holy Ghost uh, being poured out and people talking in tongues. And, and they said, one of them said to the other said, if they can have it then, why can't we have it now? And somebody said, why don't we pray for it? And so they began to pray. And he said, I can tell you something came over that room and something happened in that room. And he said, I jumped up feeling something I never felt before. It started up here and it ran out my feet. And he said, I don't know what it is. But I looked at somebody and said, hey, I used to be a freak for the devil. I think I'll just be a Jesus freak now. <laughs> Two hours of going through the book of Acts and explaining some things to Billy. Billy said, all right, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. Because you see, the first step is repentance. The second step is baptism in Jesus' name. The Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there's something about it getting there finally. They were anticipating it. They had been told to go and tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. And that didn't make any sense to them. They didn't understand that. You may be here today and none of this makes any sense to you. I understand where you are. I promise you. I'll tell you what made the difference for me. When I went home and told my mama how crazy those people were. And that I was never, ever, ever going back there again. I remember going to bed that night. And laying on my bed and looking at a ceiling. And talking to God and said, God, that was disrespectful for them to do that in the church. I never saw anything like that. God, I don't understand. But God, I know two things. Number one, I felt something I never felt before in my life. And God, number two, when I looked at the faces of those young people, they were happy. And I'm not happy. They've got something I don't have, God. That's what made a difference in me was I realized they had something I didn't have. They had a peace and a joy I didn't have. I was looking for something. And I realized this boy was looking for something. We carried him back to the Bible college. We baptized him about 4.30 that morning in the name of Jesus. He came up talking in tongues. We had a Holy Ghost time, a Pentecostal experience around an altar for a while. We took him and fed him breakfast and took him home at about 6 o'clock. And he said, I'll be back for church. That was on a Saturday night. He said, I'll be back at 10 o'clock for church. I was supposed to work that day. I called in work and got somebody to trade shifts with me for the morning. And here we waited. I told him, I said, now, Billy, I'll be standing at this door. You come and find me. I'll be at this door. Now, he had a tooth missing right here. This one, this front teeth right here was gone. And... Uh, and he had hair down on his shoulders. He had a beard down here. He smelled bad. I, I just got to be honest with you. That was the life he was living. 10 o'clock, I'm standing there at the door. And something walks up to me and he says, Praise the Lord. And he smiled and that tooth was gone. And I said, Billy? He said, Yeah. I'm not a freak anymore. I'm a child of the king. He said, I got home and looked in the mirror and thought to myself, Oh, I look like a freak. Jesus, you didn't look like a freak. I look like a freak. He said, I shaved for the first time in years. 
He said, oh, it was a rough shave too. I got to be honest with you. I didn't have much to shave with. He said, but I got it all done. He said, and then, I got to look at my hat. I got to thinking, I grew this hair when I became a hippie. And I rebelled against everything. He said, I didn't need this. He said, my best friend's mama owned a, uh, a beauty shop. He said, I went and woke her up at about 8 o'clock this morning. She looked at me and said, Billy, what do you want? He said, I want a haircut. She said, now? He said, yeah, I need to go to church and I don't want to go like this. He said, she gave me a haircut. He said, you feel something? I feel like a new man today. You see, Pentecost, it's not about, let me tell you something, it's not about how you look. When you get right with God, you're going to change a lot of things. You hear me? Some people think, well, you got to do this, do this, do this to get right with God. It's like the, the, the guy that asked the comedian, the Christian comedian, he said, Brother Mike, do I have to quit smoking dope to get Jesus? And he said, no, but if you get Jesus, you'll quit smoking dope. You don't skin a fish before you catch it. Once you catch it, it's just going to say, all right, let's do what I need to do. I didn't care what it was I needed to do. All I know is I wanted Jesus uh, and I wanted what those people had. Uh, and on Pentecost, uh, that's what it's all about. Uh, oh, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, their anticipation was over. They were in one accord, in one place, in one with one purpose. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you read on down through there, read verse 11 for me, Brother Amy. Prince of Arabians, do you hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God? And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? They're asking themselves, What meaneth this? Read on. Others mocking said, These men are filled with new wine. They're just drunk. That's what's wrong with them. They're drunk. i got to be honest with you. I've had a few experiences with God where I felt like I was just about me crawling the boat and crunch. I felt higher than Georgia Pine. I mean, I just got carried away with Jesus and I'm telling you, He carried me to a whole new level of, of, of woo! Uh, it, you know, it's better felt than told is all I can say. Read on. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Listen to what Peter said. And he said unto them, now, now, you men of whoa, 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 hold on. Now understand, it wasn't just Peter doing a solo shot here. The Bible said he stood up with the 11. Okay? If Peter was wrong, every one of them was wrong. You hear me? Some people say, oh, well, that was just Peter's idea. No, 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 no. If he was wrong, somebody would have pulled his coattail. I'm telling you right here, right now, if I get out of the Word of God, one of these guys over here is going to pull my coattail. And if one of them's up here preaching and he gets out of the Word, we're going to do the same thing for him. Why? Because we want to serve Jesus and follow His Word and live His Word. You follow me as I follow Christ. He stood up with the eleven. And he said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose. Hang on right there. He said they're not drunk as you suppose. You see that? And these are not drunken as you suppose. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day or nine o'clock in the morning. Did he say they were not drunk? No. He said they're not drunken as you suppose. They didn't been hit a different bottle. <laughs> They done got a hold of a different spigot. I'm not going to ask you how many of you have ever been drunk before. Because I did that one time and I had a little 70 year old lady raise her hand. 
And I embarrass myself asking that question. She's the most godly little lady I ever saw in my life. I asked the question, she raised her hand. So I tried to save it, and I said, Many of you ever done anything stupid when you were drunk? That little seven year old hand went up again. I'm thinking, Oh, God, what have I done now? Come on, I'm trying to give you a way out of this, Thelma. I'm trying my best, Sister Thelma, to get you out of it. I said, Okay, any of you ever got arrested when you were drunk and stupid? And that little hand went up again. I said, I'm through. I'm trying to save this little lady from embarrassment the whole time. Her little hand's going up every time. And uh, it's a funny story, but he didn't say they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk as you suppose. There's something about being full of the Spirit that makes you not need anything else. You won't need drugs. You won't need cigarettes. You won't need pornography. You won't need anything else to make you feel good. When you get Jesus like you get Jesus, you get full of the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you. You see, it all started way back when Adam and Eve messed up. We're all sinners. And we're inherently wicked because of that. And so for the first 2,500 years of man's existence, God just spoke either in an audible voice or He spoke to their conscience or their mind or their heart. And they tried to govern themselves that way. And then in the last part of the, that 2,500 years, the last 500 years or so, God chose a man named Abraham. The Bible said he was a righteous man who loved God. And he gave him a son named Isaac and a grandson named Jacob. And he began to do something with this family. And one night in a confrontation, God changed Nate, Jacob's name to Israel. And in his old age, and his family moved to Egypt, and there the descendants became the nation of Israel. Slaves to the Egyptians. And finally, God raised up a man by the name of Moses. And I'm giving you a little history here because I want to take you somewhere in the next few minutes. And God tells Moses to go and talk to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh refuses to let the children of Israel go, and the plagues come. The waters turn to blood. The insects come. The cattle die. The boils. The darkness. Nine plagues in all. And God says to Moses, and here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go out and tell every household to take a lamb. And slay that lamb. And apply the blood to the doorpost. It's the first Passover. This is what the Passover is all about. You apply it to the, to the doorpost. Now understand something. He said, I'm fixing to deliver you. I'm fixing to do something special for you. I'm getting ready. Let me tell you something. You've got to fix yourself and get yourself ready to receive what God wants to do in your life. Uh, he told him to pack your stuff up. Put your shoes on your feet. Heal that lamb. Uh, have a feast. Apply the blood uh, to the doorpost and get ready for a quick deliverance. Uh, things are fixing to happen. Uh, now remember, 50 days later, after the Passover, where the blood was shed to deliver Israel, that's when God gave Moses uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, Fifty days later, it was their first Pentecost, if you will. Pentecost simply means 50. That's what it is. It just means 50. It doesn't mean glacialalia. It doesn't mean any of those other things. It means 50. Fifty days after the first Passover, God sends the first Pentecost, if you will. Because all of a sudden, He gives them His law. For the next 1,500 years, uh, they live by that law. They read that law. It's important in their lives. Uh, they wanted to do what the law says, but somehow, what they did, they realized that even though they did everything bound by the law, they didn't have much of a relationship with God. There were a lot of people that lived by the letter of the law. The rich young ruler that came to Jesus said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus started naming the law to him. He hung his thumbs in his lapel and said, I've done that since I was a little boy. He said, Yeah, but you still don't have a relationship with me. You still don't have a relationship with me. Hear me today. You may know a whole lot about God.
God. But I'm talking to somebody here today that wants to know God for yourself. You want an experience with God. You're looking for your own Pentecost. You're looking for your own earth-shattering experience that will change your life forever. And so it was that law connected them with God Almighty until Pentecost. When you understand what happens at Pentecost, uh, Pentecost uh, is that time when you connect with Jesus. Uh, and it's interesting that it happened uh, 50 days uh, after the Passover celebration. Uh, they crucified Jesus and He rose again. And then 50 days later, 50 days later, 50 days comes the day of Pentecost. Three days after He was crucified, He resurrected and 40 something days later and on that 50th day, He said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. What promise? He said that same promise that Joel had said, I will pour out My Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall see dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Uh, then he went on to say, In a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put in you. I'm going to take away that stony heart of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, he said, And I will pour my spirit with and put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgment and do them. And then he said, The spirit of truth will come and you shall know Him. And He that lives with you shall not be with you, but be in you. Then He said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. He said, all these years I've walked with man. Now I want to be inside of man. Uh, hear me today. Pentecost is that experience uh, where the Holy Spirit lives in you. Uh, it changes your life forever. Uh, it's one thing to be walking with Him. Uh, it's another thing to be filled with His Spirit. Uh, John would write in 737 of the book of John, uh, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, uh, let him come and drink. Uh, he that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly or innermost being shall flow rivers, rivers of living water. And this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So his followers went to Jerusalem and in that upper room they waited uh, and they prayed uh, and they worshipped uh, for day after day after day. Finally, on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, 50 days after that crucifixion, uh, the great phenomenon of the world began to happen. Uh, men began to be filled with God's Spirit. Uh, it wasn't the law written on stony tablets, uh, but rather it was grace and mercy written in the hearts of men and women. Uh, and the Spirit of God was filling, willing vessels. God had a plan to save people. God had a plan. And when those spirit-filled, intoxicated on the spirit people, spirit-motivated, hit the streets in Jerusalem, guess what happened? A church was born. Uh, 3,000 souls uh, were born into the kingdom uh, in one day. Uh, you talking about a church on fire? That church was on fire. Uh, people were going out telling everybody they knew. Uh, Pentecost changed the world. Uh, it's more than the name of a church. Uh, it's more than the name of a movement. Uh, it's God's desire for our secular and humanistic world. It's God's desire for every man, woman, boy, and girl. We're all born sinners. But Jesus said you must be born again. Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, what do I have to do? And he said, you must be born again. He said, man, I'm an old man. How can I enter back into my mother's womb and be born again? He said, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. And it's pretty easy for people to understand being born of water means to be baptized. I mean, it's really pretty easy. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 1 Peter 3, 21 is speaking of Noah's miraculous escape from the waters of the flood. It says, And like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. 1 Corinthians 10 and 2 teaches us that Israel was baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea. It teaches that baptism is that line of demarcation. It separates their old life from your new life. In Acts 2 and 38, it records, Repent. 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. You see, what they had in the first gospel sermon that pricked their heart, stirred them, said, what do I have to do? And he said, you need to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. If you're here today and you've never been born again of the water and of the Spirit, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name and you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, it's still the same answer today. Uh, it was always the answer before. Uh, it's still the answer right now. As they come to the music, I want you to hear me today. God's answer doesn't change. Uh, your problems may change, uh, but God's solution is the same. Uh, you need to be filled with His Spirit. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, he said, except a man be born again of water and of Spirit. Uh, if you're going to see me, uh, He said, you're going to have to be born again of the Spirit. Uh, something in that Spirit's got to change in your world. If you really want it, you can have that life of God living inside of you. You see, Pentecost is not a name of some churches or organizations. Would you stand with me? Being Pentecostal by name only won't save you. I'm sorry, it just won't save you. It won't, it won't save you any more than climbing a tree, eating a banana makes you money. It's just not going to do it. It's not just a religious choice made by some. I'm going to sum it up real, real, real easy for you. Pentecost is an experience that can be had by everybody. It's a life-changing experience. It's a soul-saving experience. Uh, it's a first step to eternal life experience. Uh, it's a, a life-altering experience. Uh, it's more than just salvation. Uh, it's an intimate relationship with God. Uh, let hear me today. Uh, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, you get into a relationship with God. Uh, what I realized in that very first service uh, that I attended that day that I didn't understand uh, what may have brought peace and joy and happiness to the lives of those young people I was looking at uh, was not where they were raised. Uh, it was what God had filled them with. Uh, it was His Spirit. Uh, hear me today. Uh, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. The beautiful part is you can have that renewing over and over again. When you're filled with that Spirit of God, it renews your mind. It gives you deliverance. It's joy.